Let's continue in Hebrews 1. Hopefully we'll finish this chapter today. We've been in this chapter uh, about six weeks now. Maybe longer, maybe seven. But let's continue at the end of Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 11 says, They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old, as doth the garment. He's speaking of the heavens and the visible universe above us. They shall perish. You know, your clothes are going to wear out. Your car will eventually wear out. The land wears out. Your body wears out. Even the sun and the moon and the earth uh, will eventually wear out. He says, but thou remainest. God doesn't wear out. And um, this is a hard concept for atheists uh, to admit to. The, the God of the Holy Bible, as the creator of all those things, by definition, had no beginning of his own. And therefore, he can never wear out. The created things of God will wear out eventually. This much is agreed upon by evolutionists and unbelievers. This is what's known as entropy. Entropy is the loss of heat and energy in a closed system, uh, or the second law of thermodynamics. And simply put, um, unless some outside source replenishes that thing with new energy, the energy within it will eventually dissipate and, and vanish. It's like the fuel tank on your car. Uh, unless you put new gasoline into the tank, uh, the gasoline will eventually be used up. And even if you don't start the engine and use up the, the gasoline, over time the gasoline itself will break down to something akin to kerosene or something like that, and you're not able to use it. So unless you have a new supply, you're going to run out of energy. And... Um, and that is the way the universe we see, the visible creation we see and live in, functions. The visible universe has a limited shelf life, you might say. Uh, best if used by this date, right? Mm -hmm. um, the visible, uh, the creation, but the creator himself does not. The creator himself is not limited like the things which he has made. He told Moses, I am that I am, Exodus 3, 14. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of, of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. The God of the scriptures merely exists without any explanation. And uh, the idea that you would insist God explain himself to you is rather presumptuous on, uh, presumptuous on your part. Why would God entertain that? Why would God answer your demands? He's under no obligation to answer anyone's demands. But um, turn back, if you will, to the book of Job. Job 11. Job 11. And one verse there, verse 7, the question is asked here, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? The obvious answer should be no. Go also to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans 11, and let's begin there at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. His creation is at his disposal and it's there to serve him if he desires. And that includes you and me. That includes us. 
and uh, no human mind can fully comprehend God, the God of the Bible. Now, the God of other religions, some of the cults, which were invented purely by man and the imagination of men, they can be more easily <laughs> comprehended. The idea that the God of the Mormon religion, for example, lives inside his creation on one of his own planets or stars. Uh, and on that star, he is busy with his multi multitude of wives uh, creating spirit babies. And uh, without being a crass or crude, you might get on the internet sometime and type in world population data, world population growth. And uh, eventually you'll find uh, a counter, a counter that's com continually increasing in new births of people coming into the world. And then next to it there'll be a, a, a counter which is reversing, subtracting people as they die. And uh, the number of new people being born into the world, about nine new ones per second, uh, is far outpaces the number of people dying every day. That means gradually, slowly but surely, the world's population is growing and increasing. And you have to tell yourself, you know, the God of the Mormons is a pretty busy fellow. He's, not, he's too busy to answer my prayers, but he's certainly got plenty of time to keep fathering children. You know, there's something wrong with that entire picture. Let me just put it that way. But, uh, or that God cares what kind of uh, undergarments you're wearing. That's, that's another thing. And I've said this, I tried to illustrate it as, as absurdly as I know how, but to think that God, who has the universe to maintain, he has the entire visible creation to oversee, uh, suddenly stops and asks, what are you wearing under there? <laughs> that's not a God that I have any respect for. Uh, that's not a God that, that you and I worship. So, <laughs> at least I hope it was an absurd way of illustrating it, because that's what I intended. But no human mind can fully comprehend uh, the God of the Bible. The eternity and the infinite scope of God's nature uh, are confounding to the mind of man. Go back, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Isaiah 40, and let's read, beginning there at verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Um, also go, if you will, to Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. So God is eternal. His existence, his very nature, is infinite in scope. There is no limitation to God. He never had a beginning, and he will never have an ending. Those concepts of time, and when something starts, and when something stops, those things were all created by God for our use and for our benefit. But as I said, uh, I think in our church hour, God himself, that made the visible creation, is by definition outside of the creation. He sees everything that has ever transpired or ever will uh, transpire uh, at the same moment. There is no uh, problem uh, con in the continuity of time and space with God. But the text in our, our, of our text around in Hebrews 1 says that his creation will wax old as doth a garment. Notice Isaiah 51. 
And verses 5 and 6. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. That's a great promise at a time when a man's salvation was tenuous at best. It was based upon his uh, strict obedience to the laws and the commandments that came from Moses and then repeated and reinforced by the prophets. Um, but God said, my salvation shall be forever. Notice there, uh, you know, the visible things will wear out. But the invisible things will never wear out. That's why the Lord Jesus said, God is a spirit. John 4, verse 24. God cannot be measured and defined and, uh, and mocked and ridiculed by the devices of men or the opinions of men. And God has no obligation to reveal himself uh, to, to men. The, it's amazing that the skeptics have wanted to ask, how can something like an invisible God have an effect upon a physical or visible world, or the world, uh, the physical creation within the world. And uh, Ken Hoven had a great response, which is taken off on the internet. That is, uh, you're assuming uh, a God different from the one I worship. The God, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, by definition, is not limited by time and space. Uh, and uh, if you think that something invisible cannot have an effect or an influence upon the visible creation, then you have to take into account such things as love and emotion and feelings and motivations and anger and jealousy. All of those invisible uh, and intangible things can oftentimes play a major part in a physical response, right? A physical reaction. It can motivate you to do any number of physical things. Um, and you say, the thing that inspired me was something I can't put my hands on, I can't define it, I can't see it, but it nevertheless motivated me to behave a certain way. I think that's about a fair enough answer. And verse 12, back in our text, And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Without being sacrilegious or irreverent, someday God is going to change his clothing. He's talking about a vesture being folded up after it waxes old. He's going to put on, put the universe away and replace it with a new universe one day. Go forward just a little bit to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and notice two verses there, verses 12 and 13. 2 Peter 3, verses 12 and 13. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. I happened upon a um, an atheist questioning a, a believer recently on online and uh, and the atheist's way of mocking was to say if God is so powerful and God is such a good God and he's such a kind and loving God and his, and his acts and his works are perfect as you say then why are there sunspots why are there anomalies in the universe why are there supposed stars exploding uh, out in the distant galaxies, and uh, what, to what purpose? Why is there such chaos taking place uh, in outer space as we, as we perceive it and can observe it? Uh, if it's such a perfect creation, why is there so much uh, turmoil and upheaval taking place uh, out there in distant galaxies and planets? But, um, see, the atheist doesn't realize 
that you and I are looking forward to a new universe, a new heaven, a new earth, uh, wherein dwelleth righteousness, as verse 13 here um, in 2 Peter 3 has it. And uh, this one we live in now isn't the one we're always going to live in. It's not the one we expect to last forever. Go back now to the book of Mark, chapter 15. Mark 15. And uh, let's begin there with verse 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to be crucified, or rather, to crucify him. Verse 24. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. Also go back to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And verse 31 says, After that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. In verse 35, And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Christ's uh, attire was referred to by different words in the scriptures. They were called his clothes, they were called his garments, and they were called his vesture, but never a robe, never a robe. John 19, verse 2, tells us, And the soldiers planted a crown of thorn, that's an old English word, it means to weave, weave thorns together, planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. This was a way of mocking him. And uh, if you understand that the origins of the Roman Catholic Church began with the Roman Empire, then you see that those soldiers putting that crown of thorns on Christ's brow and uh, putting a, a robe of purple on him to mock him as a pretend king, the king of the Jews and so forth, it was all done uh, as a way of ridiculing him. The purple robe is still the color, the color for the Synod of Catholic bishops throughout the world right now. The, office of Caesar began to be morphed eventually into the Roman pontiff. Actually, Roman pontiff was the term they applied to Caesar at that time. Now it's a term applied to the Pope of Rome, the pontiff, the supreme pontiff. And the Roman Senate eventually was replaced by the College of Cardinals, those uh, among whom they would elect a new Caesar or now elect a new Pope. And they took the existing empire, the, the, you've heard about the Romans' roads, that's why the verses in the book of Romans are called that, because it's an easy hop, skip, and a jump from one verse to another to present the gospel to somebody. But uh, the Roman empire was known for paving roads throughout the entire known world as they controlled it. There are still paved roads laid down by the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago on which carts and vehicles still travel 2,000 years later. And that's how extensive their road system uh, connecting one city to another, one country to another was. And the Catholic Church simply swooped in and sought to dominate that empire and create a state church in which their leader was now the head of the Roman Catholic Empire and therefore, their church spreads out throughout the world as a physical enterprise, like a physical business corporation with a branch office in every neighborhood, right? Managed by the local priest. But <clears throat> they were a picture of the Roman Catholic system at the time, which never has gotten the person of Lord Jesus Christ straight. They struggle with the scriptures. The scriptures are in a foreign language to them. Um, but if you want to learn the English Bible, then you have to become acquainted 
with and pay attention to the English vocabulary which it's composed of. Notice, if you will, John chapter 19. John 19 and verse 23. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. His outer garment was not only called his clothes, his garments, his vesture, but here was also called a coat. And without seam, woven from the top throughout. That would be very much like a, a poncho uh, or a serape that they, they still wear in Mexico and in South America with a hole at the apex of the opening and then it widens as it goes down over the body. <clears throat> and you know we've talked about the the overall shape of the universe and I think I mentioned too that it may be very much like that where it's narrow at the top, uh, beyond the North Star, where the third heaven may be situated, beyond the, beyond the visible creation, and then it widens as it goes out, and all of the galaxies and all the star systems and solar systems are moving around uh, that, uh, that space um, as God has directed them to do so. But that's, uh, some of that is still conjecture on my part, so I won't be very dogmatic about that. But it narrow at the apex, and then it widens as it goes downward over the body. And once again, notice the end of verse 12 in our text. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. And that's very true. God, uh, I, I like what Ken Hovind said. I sometimes refer to him because he's made some very keen on uh, observations along the way. He says, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? There was never a moment where God didn't know everything. There was nothing new that caught God off guard or surprised God that he didn't know prior. So, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? And it's hard, as I said, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the concept of a God like that. And yet, that's the God of the Bible. He's not a God who's, who's a temperamental and will send you to damnation if you don't pray the rosary consistently day after day, or you don't uh, wear the right kind of underpants, as the Mormon Church would have you do so. He's not like that at all. And he's not offended if you uh, don't call him Jehovah, like the JWs want you to. And uh, I've read to you from their own reference Bible, they don't even know how to pronounce God's name. They admit it in their reference Bible that no one knows how to pronounce the divine name. But they say Jehovah because it's easy to remember and people have heard it in the past. But they admit no one knows how to pronounce it. Well, if no one knows how to pronounce it, then it can't be that big of a deal, can it? Or that God's going to get upset if you don't worship Him on Saturday rather than Wednesday night prayer meeting or on Sunday morning like the Adventists. God is not like that at all. The Seventh-day Adventists will say, Genesis chapter 2, God, uh, thus the heavens and the earth were created in six days and God rested on the seventh day. And then they'll go from there, to, from Genesis 2, straight to Exodus 20 and say, uh, keep, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For in six, six days God created the heaven and the earth and rested on the seventh day. And they will insist that God has always set aside the seventh day as the day on which to rest and focus your attentions on God. But they fail to mention that between Genesis 2 and Exodus 20, about 2,500 years unfolded. And there's not a single commandment from the Lord to anybody to worship or to rest on the seventh day. God didn't tell Noah, he didn't tell his three sons, he didn't tell Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or his 12 sons. It wasn't even brought up until after the Egyptian captivity, 400 years of captivity there, 
And God began giving commandments to the Israelites as they're leaving Egypt. 2,500 years of Bible history unfolded, and God didn't say a peep about resting on the seventh day. That's the one detail the Seventh-day Adventists seem to miss. But the God of the Bible is not like that. He's not temperamental and gets his feelings hurt by, by a Calvinist who says, I have free will. And God says, no, you don't. I'm in charge. That's not the God of the Bible. That's a God of somebody's philosophical imagination, but it has nothing to do with the God of the Scriptures. Notice there, <clears throat> verse 13 in our text, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Well, God said that to none of the angels. But he certainly said that and reinforced that to his only begotten Son. Uh, in fact, just look up at verse 8 once again. <clears throat> but under the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, that's God addressing the Son as God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And then verse 14 uh, asks, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So angels are spirits. Go back to the book of Acts, chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, <clears throat> and uh, we'll look at just one verse there, that is verse 8. It says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. There are three things listed there, the resurrection, the angel, and the spirit. But since angels are said to be spirits in our text, the two terms uh, are interchangeable. That's why the verse says the Pharisees confess both, rather than saying they confess all three. Because angels and spirits, those terms can be used interchangeably in the scriptures. And I think that's very enlightening. I used to struggle over that. Why does he say confess both? when there are three things listed there. But according to Hebrews 1, the angels are said to be ministering spirits. So therefore, spirit and angel can be uh, interchanged with each other for our purposes, and therefore the Pharisees confess both rather than all three. And then verse 14 mentions, uh, to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Notice it says them, plural, who shall be heirs, plural. Salvation for the sinner in this age is an individual transaction. It's an individual decision that you, as a sinner, have to make. When uh, Paul and Silas uh, were singing and praising God in the, in the jail in Philippi, in Acts 16, and their bonds were loosed, and uh, the jailer sprung in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's an individual. Thou is an individual. Ye is plural in the King James English. And thou shalt be saved, and thy house. In other words, if they believe, they'll be saved too. But this idea that we're all collectively saved because we belong to the same race, or we belong to the same denomination, or we've all subscribed to the same list of dogmas and church doctrines, is uh, false. Salvation for the sinner uh, is an individual transaction. God deals with you one-on-one. -on -one. Romans 14, verse 12 states, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 2, verse 6 who shall render to every man according to his deeds. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Your salvation wasn't inherited, but it was received by the new birth, and it's only spoken of as an inheritance one time, when Simon Peter 
says that you've been begotten, he says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, verse 4. But the inheritance in all other places is a millennial inheritance following the tribulation. Peter's reference is not to salvation, to our salvation from sin, but to a place reserved for us in New Jerusalem one day. Christ said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, that place, to be more specific, is going to be New Jerusalem, and within that celestial city, my mansion is waiting for me, and so is yours. Uh, so the two possible meanings here, verse 14, to them that shall be heirs of salvation, uh, there's two possible meanings. Number one, people who endure to the end of the tribulation without taking the mark of the beast and by coupling their faith with their good works, as we've talked about many times before, Revelation 12 and Revelation 14, and for them, they inherit salvation as an earned reward for having survived to the end of the tribulation without knuckling under the pressure to uh, worship the man of sin or to take his mark. And the other possible interpretation, in the book of Revelation, out beyond time when God changes his vesture, a new heavens and a new earth, uh, eternity sets in, and angels minister to those who are born among the saved nations during the thousand-year kingdom which precedes it. Now, I know that's a lot of uh, description that's not easily grasped on the surface, which I, I fully acknowledge and confess to you. But Revelation 22, verse 2, tells us that in eternity future, there will be the tree of life, quote, which bear twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And that's after the thousand year kingdom is over, and a uh, new heavens and a new earth appear, and uh, in, that, in that celestial world, that new world, there will be the tree of life, and those who live through the tribulation, and they don't they, don't, they do not rebel against Jesus Christ at the end, as all nations, so many nations will. Satan's sent out and uh, leads the nations in one last rebellion against Jesus Christ. And of course, Christ has no time for that. He puts it down rather quickly. But those who do not will live and go into, or their descendants will go into the eternity, the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness and the angels will minister unto them. And uh, I will throw this out to you. Um, it may be that you and I, as saints in this age, also participate in ministering to those at that time. Why do I say that? Well, uh, the term sons of God is found four times in the Old Testament. Genesis 6, Job 1, Job 2, and Job 38. In all four cases, that reference is not to someone who's been born again by trusting in Christ, but it's clearly a reference to angelic-type beings. And um, Job 1 talks about the sons of God coming to present themselves, and then Satan coming to present himself uh, before God. How that worked exactly, I don't know, so don't ask me to explain it afterwards, right? <laughs> but it never once in the Old Testament refers to someone who's been born again by trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's a reference to angelic beings of some kind before the coming of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. And uh, the book of Jude talks about those angels which, which, left not, which uh, kept not their first estate. Uh, he hath uh, put in chains and everlasting, everlasting darkness until a future day of judgment. 
So some of those angels who rebelled and came to the world intermixed with earthly women uh, lost their station as angels in God's kingdom, if you want to call it that, and uh, they're waiting to be replaced by saints who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um, 1 John 3, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3 say, Beloved, uh, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So the Bible calls you and I sons of God now. We just don't see it. It hasn't been made manifest to us yet. We haven't received that glorified form of Jesus Christ yet. And um, one of our men some time back, he and I were talking about this, he was asking, well, how many, how many angels fell in that with Satan in Genesis chapter 6? And all I can say is I have no idea. If there have been, let's say if there's been a billion Christians saved since the thief on the cross got saved, that's a billion people who become the sons of God when they get their new body at the rapture. Does that mean a billion angels left their first estate? I have no idea. Maybe God's simply ad adding to them. He's expanding the number of them. And so on that basis, you and I may be uh, um, enjoined to minister to those saints coming out of the millennial kingdom and entering into the new heaven and new earth uh, in eternity. 